Could members please take their seats? Um, as the principal deputy speaker has outlined, it falls upon me as temporary speaker to chair this particular debate. Could I just remind uh, all members in my role of temporary speaker, I will, of course, uh, discharge my duties during this debate impartially. Uh, the item on the order paper is a private member's motion. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. Mr. Dowd. But yet within the motion, there is no mention of a ministerial breach of the COVID-19 regulations. I just want clarity in terms of what members are debating today and what members are voting on. The Honourable Member for Perban for his uh, intervention. Uh, the titles of motions are determined by members when they table their motions. Uh, there's admissibility criteria, two motions, uh, but the wording of the motion is a separate matter. Uh, you have a concern about the title, however, it has been, this has, issue has been considered, and the title and the motion are in order, understanding orders. I now call upon the clerk to read the motion. That this Assembly acknowledges the immense sacrifices that people, families and communities have made during the COVID-19 emergency, pays tribute to those who selflessly prioritised the need to keep each other safe above their own personal needs, particularly during times of trauma, loss and grief, expresses disappointment in the actions of those in ministerial office who breached public guidance and failed to share in the sacrifice that we have asked of others, implores members of the public to stay with us and to continue acting in accordance with the regulations in order to keep each other safe and prevent further deaths, recommits to upholding the spirit and the letter of the COVID-19 regulations and the related public health guidance, and calls on the Deputy First Minister and the Minister of Finance to apologise for their actions which have caused immense hurt. Thank you. I call upon Christopher Stolford to move the motion. Mr Stolford. Mr Temporary Speaker, over the course of recent days, members of this House have been asked by senior government ministers not only to suspend their critical faculties, but to suspend their physical senses as well. In a fashion that would shame Kellyanne Conway, the Deputy First Minister asks us given members an indication of the timing for the debate, so I will, you'll have your full that was a good line, so. 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Business Committee have allowed up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will indeed have his full 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. minutes. Mr Stolford. Mr Acting Speaker, that there is no ministerial response in this debate, as all other speakers you have indicated will have five minutes. I understand that Mrs O'Neill is responding in her capacity as Deputy First Minister, and in that role she is entitled to 15 minutes, rather than the normal five minutes allocated to individual members. How could it be that Ms O'Neill is responding as Deputy First Minister, uh, speaking on behalf of the Executive Office. Should we infer from that that the First Minister has assented to that and that when Ms O'Neill does rise, she is speaking on behalf of the Executive Office, which means she is also speaking on behalf of the First Minister? That is a valid point of order, Mr Alistair. Uh, I am simply relaying what the business office and the clerk, the information we received. It would be up to the Deputy First Minister, Ms O'Neill, to address that point during her 15-minute address to the Assembly. Mr Stolford. Oh, Mr Alistair. It is not to address that point. 
If Ms O'Neill is appearing in this House on behalf of the Executive Office, then custom and practice dictates that she can only appear in that role with the assent of the First Minister. So is she appearing on behalf of the Executive Office to speak for 15 minutes on behalf of that office? If she is only speaking on her own behalf, then she should be restricted to five minutes and speak from the back benches, I would have thought. Well, well the member has been around this building almost as long as I have, and he knows the protocol that when someone is responding in their capacity as an executive minister, they have 15 minutes. I have no doubt that when Mrs O'Neill is speaking, you will be very quick to your feet to ask her that very point, and I'm sure uh, she will address that. But at the moment, I am simply relaying the information that has been received by the business office. It's not a for the business office or myself to decide uh, anything beyond that, and I can confirm that she is addressing the Assembly at the end of this debate in her capacity as Deputy First Minister. Mr Lance. Thank you very much. I would just like to make it clear uh, on behalf of the First Minister that this is not a joint statement on behalf of the Executive Office. Mr Alistair. Ms O'Neill, given the, nature, the joint nature of the office, address this House as Deputy First Minister on behalf of that office if she does not have the consent of the First Minister, because Ms O'Neill in this House has no power as Deputy First Minister. Any power she has is solely the power of the Joint Office. And if the Joint Office is not consenting to her speaking as Deputy First Minister, then she cannot speak as Deputy First Minister. Is that not correct? Uh, uh, Mrs O'Neill. Can I confirm to you, Les Concorlio, our temporary speaker, that I intend to speak as an MLA this evening and respond to this debate? I don't know where the confusion has come from, but it's certainly not in my making. Well, that does raise an interesting point, because normally someone who's a minister is automatically entitled to 15 minutes in their capacity as a member of the executive if they're responding to a debate. Individual members, even if they're ministers but who are speaking as private individuals, are only allocated five minutes. The difficulty here is that the business office was informed that Mrs O'Neill was responding to the debate in that capacity. Therefore, we allocated her 15 minutes, and that's quite normal and, and the right thing to do. Uh, the difficulty here is, is that we have now allocated the time accordingly, and the, the difficulty is if Mrs O'Neill is telling us that she's speaking as an ordinary MLA, well, then she would be restricted to five minutes rather than 15. I should respectfully suggest, if she's speaking as an MLA, then she has five minutes. End of. Yes, I think your interpretation is right, Mr Alistair, and I'm thankful, grateful to Ms O'Neill for confirming her status for this debate and Mr Lanz's intervention. So uh, I don't know, Ms O'Neill, whether you've prepared a 15-minute speech or a five-minute speech. I have no doubt there will be various references to you during the debate, and you may have an opportunity to intervene. But I'm therefore I'm ruling that on this occasion it is five minutes uh, for the, uh, the speech. But that still means uh, that there is ten minutes for either Mr Stolford or his nominee to submit at the end of his particular contribution. Sorry, Mr Stolford, you still have your ten minutes. Thank you, Mr Temporary Speaker. In a fashion that would shame the Trump administration, the Deputy First Minister asks us to shut our eyes to what we all can see and to stuff our ears to drown out what we all can hear. We are urged to rely upon alternative facts. Ad nauseum has been the repetition of her assertion that she abided by the guidelines that she wrote and imposed upon every other citizen in this country. That pretense cannot be sustained unless we close off all reason and judgment. Let us examine the facts. What do the regulations that the Deputy First Minister had a hand in drafting actually say? They are very clear. They state, these regulations further amend the Health Protection Coronavirus Restriction Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 in order to allow gatherings of up to 30 people in public places and outdoors. Thus far, the lamentable defence of her actions that the Deputy First Minister 
has provided hinges on a spurious premise that the crowd following the cortege at Mr. Storey's funeral constitutes the funeral, whilst the parade walking behind does not. We are asked to divorce one from the other. However, we cannot. Our eyes will not allow us to do that, for we can see, leaving aside the fact that there were clearly more than 30 people walking in the cortege, there were hundreds more walking behind them and in close proximity, and there were thousands in Milltown Cemetery, but I'll come on to Milltown later. This clearly and openly constitutes a breach of the regulations. Furthermore, given the images that have emerged showing a mass procession, I would be grateful if the Deputy First Minister could confirm whether Sinn Féin, who I am given to understand, organised this event, submitted the requisite 11 bar 1 form to the Parades Commission. If not, that constitutes a further breach in the law and one which I suspect the Deputy First Minister's party would be very quick to seize upon if others were guilty of it. There are other reasons. The other reason why the defence of 30 in the cortege constituting the funeral breaks down is because of what happened in Milltown. The regulations state that gatherings should be up to 30. The Deputy First Minister wrote them. She knows both the letter and the spirit of those regulations. Why then was a public address system necessary to be set up in Milltown Cemetery? You don't need a public address system if you intend to address 30 people. Is the Deputy First Minister seriously contending that that which occurred in Milltown Cemetery was separate from Mr Storey's funeral? If it was, it didn't constitute part of his funeral. It constituted a Sinn Féin rally in a cemetery. If you're abiding by the letter and the spirit of the regulations, you also don't advertise public gatherings. Yet that is precisely what Sinn Féin did. Republican activists were recruited from all over the country to attend this event. Indeed, some enjoyed the occasion so much that they were posing for selfies with the Deputy First Minister in yet another breach of the regulations which she authored. So there we have it, sir. More than 30 in attendance, hundreds more behind them in a procession, widespread advertising of an event, installing a public address system in a cemetery, a mass rally in a cemetery, posing for selfies. And yet, the Deputy First Minister continues to insist that her actions were within the regulations. I think that's for the birds. All of this is most regrettable because I think the Northern Ireland executive had actually been doing well in dealing with the pandemic that we're in the middle of. After a period of three years without devolution and these institutions and those of us who occupy them being held in contempt by the wider community, we were making progress in terms of how people feel about the assembly. I regret to say that the, First Minister, the Deputy First Minister's credibility is now shot to bits. I don't say that to be cruel or to be unpleasant. It's simply a statement of fact. What credibility there was is now gone. At the recent meeting of the Executive Office Committee, the Deputy First Minister told me that it was not for me to adjudicate upon what funerals she could or could not attend. Yet, sir, that is precisely the power that she has assumed for herself that we gave her over the course of the last four months. Not only did the Deputy First Minister take on those powers, but she was zealous 
in telling us all how necessary they were. As a consequence, many people in this country lost out on giving their loved ones the funeral that they would have liked. Seemingly, those rules do not apply if a senior member of Sinn Féin is the person being buried. That's what really sticks in people's craw. That is what is at the core of this issue. Do as I say, not as I do. I have no doubt today, sir, an attempt will be made to brazen this out in the hope that once we've all had our say, that will be the end of the matter. That's not my intention. And I'm asking the Executive Office Committee Chairman, Mr McGrath, to consider initiating a committee-led inquiry into the, these events in order to establish on the record of this House the scale of the breaches that occurred. Cannot have a situation. Senior government minister, week after week, fronts up press conference, urging our people to sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice, only to then apply different standards when the person being buried is a colleague. No matter how much Mr Storey may have meant to the Deputy First Minister, and I accept what she said at the Executive Office Committee that he meant a great deal to her, there are other people who didn't have the chance to give the se a send-off to others who mean a great deal to them. On the 4th of June, the Deputy First Minister herself said, we have to send a message very clearly that by gathering in such big crowds, we're actually spreading the virus and that's killing the people, and that's killing people. That was on the 4th of June, and it was said in relation to the Black Lives Matter protest that occurred at the front of Belfast City Hall and in other places. The events at Milltown made that look tiny by comparison. So why does the principle apply in relation to people taking part in a Black Lives Matter event, but the principles don't apply in relation to people participating in a Republican event. In conclusion, sir, I am sad that we have come to this juncture, but like many other people in this country, I'm outraged and disgusted at the persistent denial of that which we can see for ourselves. And the longer that persistent denial goes on, the credibility of the Deputy First Minister melts away like snow off a ditch. Thank you. And I call upon Orlea Flynn. Mrs Flynn. Yes, um, thank you, Mr Tempery, Speaker. Um, and tonight I will be speaking to oppose this motion. Um, I want to begin by saying that um, I and the entire Sinn Féin team recognise how difficult and how challenging these past few months have been for everyone, um, but particularly for those who have lost a loved one to COVID-19 or those who have had to endure the heartache of losing someone during this pandemic. I recognise the members of this chamber um, who have lost close relatives during this time and their heartbreak. I want to take this opportunity to offer my sincere condolences to every single family who have lost a loved one during this time, and to every family out there who are going through the difficult and heart-wrenching process of grief. That includes the family and the friends of Bobby Storey. Bobby Storey, who tragically passed away on the 21st of June, was a very dear friend of mine. He was a person of huge influence and inspiration, not just to me personally, but to many hundreds of thousands of Republicans across this island and further afield. Bobby was a mentor, a champion, always in my corner, and he did his very best to support me and many other younger Republicans within our party. He was loved by so many from the constituency of West Belfast. He had earned the respect of the community of West Belfast, Republican or otherwise. And it is always with a smile that I will think of Bobby, including here tonight. But I would rather not thank you. But in discussing this motion, um, I am mindful tonight of the grief and of the sorrow that his family are experiencing. 
and my heart is sore for my friend and my colleague, Bobby's heartbroken partner, Teresa. My heart is sore for their children, some of them my very, very good friends. My heart is sore for their young grandchildren, some of them still only trying to make sense of what has happened, or still don't understand what has happened at all. And my heart sore for Bobby's nearest and dearest lifelong friends. In two days of discussion in this chamber, there has been little consideration for the pain presently being experienced by the family of Bobby Story. No expressions or very little expression of sympathy and no condolences. How many members here in the midst of this week's incessant media coverage, the tweets, the Facebook statuses, the interviews, how many have genuinely given any thought to the grieving family of Bobby Story? It seems for many in this chamber, the family of a Republican activist is worthy of less respect and less consideration. I have thought constantly about the family of Bobby Story, the Pickering family, the Story family, about his young grandchildren who have lost their granda Bobby, and Teresa who's lost her partner and the love of her life. Their pain every day since Bobby has passed is real and it's heartfelt. We can all have our own and very different perspectives on the life and the contribution of Bobby's story and also about the events of his funeral. But I would urge members tonight who will rise to their feet to speak on this motion to please, please also accept and remember that his family are grieving and that their grief is as deep and as difficult as the pain of anyone else. Whatever the issues we're discussing here tonight, we should all recognise the diminishing the dead diminishes us all. Gormila Mayogov. Thank you, Mrs. Flynn. Could I say, uh, members, that this is an issue which I'm sure everyone has a strong opinion on, but could I thank both Mr. Stolford and Mrs. Flynn for the tone of their contribution uh, in the first two opening speeches? And I'm absolutely certain that will be perpetuated by Mr. Daniel McCrossan. Mr. McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Temporary Speaker. Um, I absolutely acknowledge that there is a grieving family, but I also acknowledge that there are many grieving families whose grief has been compound, compounded by their inability to have a traditional wake and funeral, something so important to uh, the very fabric of our society. The SDLP recognises the grief of the Story family, and we do extend our thoughts and prayers to them at this time. But this debate is not about the Story family. This debate is about we as an institution practicing what we preach to ensure confidence in this House and in our executive and those who lead our executive. The lockdown restrictions haven't been easy for many people, but the vast majority of people across the North have heeded the advice which we as an institution gave only this week. The US Special Envoy Mick Mulvaney praised our efforts in curtailing this deadly virus on these shores. I am proud as an MLA for West Truro in the fact and knowing that the actions taken by this executive and by this cham chamber have had and continue to have life-saving consequences for the public and saved countless lives. Mr. Temporary Speaker, we have made a massive impact on stopping COVID-19 here, and this is due to the many sacrifices that people have made during lockdown, as instructed by our executive continually week in and week out. These personal sacrifices will continue to have a massive toll on people, and this is especially the case in terms of funerals. Many families have had to say goodbye to loved ones with no wake, with no physical mass, and no fu uh, funeral burial at all. That we've all become accustomed to uh, during COVID-19. The sacrifices these families have had to make are immeasurable and will stay with them for the rest of their lives. I've seen this firsthand across my constituents in West Tyrone, where grandsons, granddaughters, nieces, nephews, cousins, sons, daughters, brothers and sisters, neighbours and friends were unable to attend the funerals of loved ones and their friends. And Mr Speaker, they are doing this on the advice given to them by our executive every week. This motion is about recognising the immense pain and hurt that has been caused to people in all of our communities who were asked to make significant sacrifices in the interest of protecting friends and protecting families. I think we should reflect on the scale of that sacrifice that every single member present here today has asked the people in our respective communities and constituencies to make on a daily basis. 
I think today of my colleagues in the SDLP who were lifelong friends of our dear friend John Dallet, a former Deputy Speaker of this House. We were denied the opportunity to say goodbye and honour his contribution to our island, to our peace, to his people in East Derry. We made the decision that our pain, our grief, our needs have, come to have, have to come second to the public health advice that we have all committed to and asked others to do the same. I think of colleagues in other parties in this chamber, like Edwin, who has experienced the loss of a loved one and who weren't able to share their pain with family members in the way that we normally would, and the sacrifice that he and his party colleagues have also made in terms of attending the funeral of his late father. It is a matter of profound regret that having asked so many to selflessly put their pain, personal pain aside and to act to keep each other safe, that members of our executive, including the joint head of government, could not share in that sacrifice. And that's what is at the heart of today's issue. It just seems that to many out there, there's a hierarchy of pain that ministers in Sinn Féin have created. For a party that claims ownership of the idea of republicanism, the principle that all citizens are equal and that everyone will be afforded the same opportunities and treatment under the law, the actions of those ministers are a, very betra a great betrayal of that ideology. And that's what has annoyed so many. There cannot be one rule for those who govern and another for the rest of us. This motion is an opportunity for those who breach the public health advice to acknowledge the additional hurt and pain that has been caused to those who have already endured hardship throughout the COVID crisis. It is a further opportunity to apologise for the actions that have damaged the credibility of the Executive's public health messaging. I am not sure that the Deputy First Minister or her party fully understand the depth of damage that has been caused to the credibility of these institutions. I would appeal to the vast majority of people who have abided by the regulations to please continue doing so to ensure that each of us are kept safe. Do not allow this to derail your commitment to fighting this virus and looking out for each other. In spite of the breach of trust that has taken place, please stay with us. And I'd ask the Deputy First Minister, I know that, and I acknowledge that she and her party colleagues have had a great loss as well, but please acknowledge the loss that the rest of us have also endured and suffered, and that we couldn't attend those funerals. And please apologise when member... a wrong has been made. The best way to make that wrong right is to apologise and admit a mistake has been made. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. McCrossan. Uh, can I call upon Mr. Aiken, Steve Aiken? Mr. Temporary Speaker. Um, Members of the Assembly, uh, I rise in regret to bring this motion to the Assembly and indeed to the people of Northern Ireland. This, as I have said directly to the Deputy First Minister, is not a matter of orange and green. This is a matter that goes to the core of how we deal with this crisis. It is again regret that despite the biggest health challenge our citizens have faced in decades, Two ministers who purport to show leadership in the executive have flagrantly, flagrantly chosen to flout the rules and guidelines that they themselves have set and imposed. Decisions that our executive had until last Tuesday gained a hard-won and acceptance and support from the people of Northern Ireland, support that is now gone. Gone thanks to the abject failure of the Deputy First Minister, Finance Minister and indeed some MLAs for failing to abide by the very rules that we set. It is you who made the rules, sold these rules and now have indisputably broken these rules. In any other democracy, both of you would have done the decent thing and have resigned. But this is Northern Ireland. We don't have, we don't have a normal democracy. But we do have a pledge of office and that you both affirm that you will uphold the rule of law based as it is on the fundamental principles of fairness, impartiality and democratic accountability, and also to support the rule of law unequivocally in word and deed and to support all efforts to uphold it. Demonstrably, you did not do this. Instead, you have come to this House and in a degree of arrogance, unmatched except by special advisers needing eye tests in the twisting of the truth, a truth that is self-evident to everyone bar the ministers. The failure to address the issue head-on has shown that whether on the streets of Belfast or in our very cemeteries and crematoriums, there are different sets of rules. Rules in which you believe even the rules of mathematics don't apply. 
when the numbers of 10 or 30 are magically transposed to 161. But somehow in the Orwellian Adams world, your interpretation of the rules means that somehow you are more equal than the others. But, Deputy First Minister, don't take my word for it. A member of the clergy in my constituency put it much better than I ever could when he said, I have stood in my empty church and sat in my car following a brief and personal funeral with only nine other people present. And I have more than once wept about what I was not able to provide. Then I turn on the news and see a funeral in West Belfast with a multitude attending in close formation. What an insult. Clearly, because I have eyes and a brain, I could see that this was breaking of what I thought were restrictions. Deputy First Minister and Finance Minister have both failed. Failed to uphold your own rules and guidance, and you have failed to uphold your own pledge of office. But, un but unforgivably, you have put down your own narrow party interests above those of your constituents. It beggars belief, while, ni while neither of you can see that, and why you still feel you deserve to be given any respect or credibility by not just this Assembly, but especially by the family and relatives, and particularly of those 554 people who are deceased and the many thousands who have suffered from COVID. Your arrogance and the way you have spoken to the people of Northern Ireland in this Assembly is insulting. It has undermined the very health and safety of our nation, which is indeed the primary responsibility of leadership. You have failed. Both of you and the Finance Minister should have done the decent thing and resigned. Thank you, Mr. Aiken. As a result of the earlier intervention, uh, I have now been able to reallocate the 10 extra minutes that uh, Mrs. O'Neill would have had had she been speaking as DFM. So that will allow me to uh, bring in extra speakers. I can say that I will be able to bring in at least two members of the minor parties uh, to make a contribution towards the end of the debate. And I now call upon uh, I could also say thank those who have not used their full allocation, which again has helped me. And I'm now calling upon Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Temporary Speaker. Um, I will be the only speaker today on behalf of the Alliance Party. We wish our message to be clear and concise. First of all, I want to pass on my condolences to Mr. Storey's family. Grieving is at any time difficult. But to have your loved one's funeral the subject of such intense public and political scrutiny must be very difficult for the family. Many of us have made sacrifices throughout lockdown. Rules stopped us from attending wakes, funerals and from comforting family at the saddest of times. The rules stop us from visiting seriously ill family members in hospitals. The rules are difficult, but the public took on board those regulations and guidelines, keeping the R number down and the spread of COVID-19 limited. To everyone who complied with and upheld those rules, thank you. It's been really hard. Your actions have helped to save lives. Sadly, we are not free from this awful virus yet. And having recognised the public sacrifices, I come to my second point. Alliance recognises and understands why there has been such public outrage and anger expressed as a result of what took place on the 30th of June. The Alliance Party contends Sinn Féin did not act in accordance with the health regulations, but I'm not going to pick over the details of what took place. It's suffice to say others are able to wait until it's safe to come together to remember their family who died during the pandemic. They are not risking having gatherings now. While I accept the Deputy First Minister has apologised for hurt families may have felt, both she and Sinn Féin need to go further. We have been through so much over the last number of years. Unlike RHI, COVID-19 has touched every single person and family across this place. This crisis is personal. When anyone breaks the rules, it is personal and it hits everyone and everyone was looking to government here to lead us out of this crisis. Until the 30th of June, as others have said, the executive message messaging was working. It was collegiate. It was finally providing the public with confidence 
that the First Minister and Deputy First Minister were working together and the Executive was working together. However, following the actions of the 30th of June, that collegiate approach appears to have fallen apart. I really don't know how the afternoon podium announcements will be accepted or believed again. How many times have each of us heard the words, why should I? Why should I stick to the rules now? We need to rebuild the public's trust and to do all we can to bring the public with us as we all work through this crisis and the difficulties we are yet to face. And those difficulties include the end of the furlough scheme. We'll see more businesses struggle and people will lose their jobs. As discussed in the previous motion today, we have carers at breaking point who need services reinstated before they collapse. We have Brexit and the impacts that will bring. We could face a second spike, as has happened elsewhere, Leicester, Melbourne and across Spain. While the public are tired of lockdown and of making sacrifices, the virus isn't tired. It is still a threat to every person, and that's why we need the public to get back to believing the message of social distancing, washing hands and keeping safe. It is still as important now as it was in March. Before this crisis, many in this room were involved in the new decade, new approach, negotiations, and agreed to enter the executive on the basis of a better way of working together. I'm glad to hear today that um, there's an announcement of the nomination of Mr. Paul Kennedy. The Standards Commissioner will um, come into place and we'll be talking about that here in, in this place on the 21st of July. That's one of the mechanisms that we needed coming out of New Decade, New Approach. Our way of governing relies on trust and confidence. Our government is an all or nothing. It's either pull the place down or get on with it. Sadly, there is no intermediate process to work through the issue created by the actions on the 30th of June. There is only one viable option available here. And while some want to see the end to this assembly, the rest of us are here to serve the public, to take difficult decisions and to work together to get out of this crisis. To do so, we ask Sinn Féin to reflect on the damage done and in the best interests of all citizens, to recognise and own the issue they created by apologising. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now call Mr Mervyn Storey. Mr Storey. Thank you, Mr uh, Temporary Speaker. And as I rise to speak in this uh, debate this evening, I do so ever conscious that there is a family who grieve the passing of a loved one. I also do it in the light of what the scriptures tells us in those words that are often repeated, that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Because, members, we will all one day, when we pass this scene of time, not be held accountable to this assembly, but to the judge of all the earth. As we come to this debate this evening, I think Mr. McCrossan has adequately put it. The issue is not about the passing of Mr. Storey, but it is about what happened and the actions of the Deputy First Minister and others. But I wonder in this House this evening, and as people watch in, should anybody be surprised? Did this come as a shock to the people of Northern Ireland that we had in the Deputy First Minister and others such a display, such a display which really said to the people of Northern Ireland and wider afield, our republicanism, its ideology and all that it is to us is more important than the law. It's more important than doing what we had said for weeks previously. We shouldn't be surprised at double standards and double speak from the party opposite. We've had and I have suffered as a result of coming into this house. I have lost good friends who have still to this day been opposed to us coming into government with Sinn Féin. The scripture says, ultimately, by their fruits ye shall know them. 
and what is in a person's heart will ultimately be displayed in their actions and what they do. Let's remember, Mr. Temporary Speaker, that the former leader of the Republican Party denied that he was even in the IRA. How insulting to the intelligence of the people of Northern Ireland can you be? And what can we say of the families of the disappeared? What can we say of the litany of families who have grieved for many, many years because of the actions of Republicans and they have never once said where those families are, with the exception of Jean McConville. And that for, forever will hang over the heads of republicanism as a shame and a disgrace. But Mr. Temporary Speaker, the motion makes reference to the immense sacrifice of people, families and communities. The member give way? Yes, I'll give way. I appreciate the member giving way. On the 23rd of May, the Deputy First Minister said, the role of every member of society is still crucial on the journey towards recovery. The better we all follow the advice, all follow the advice and regulations that are in place, the sooner we can come out of this, the others, come out of the other side of this together. Would the member agree with me? One party decided to come out of the other side of it quicker than the rest of us. The member's an extra minute. Yes, and, and I thank that. And we, have, we have many quotes from the Deputy First Minister. I noticed that there was a quote in the Belfast Telegraph uh, prior to Mother's Day. And she rightfully, on that occasion, determined that because of the circumstances, Mother's Day would be different for those who had the joy of being able to celebrate with their mother. But I want to take you to a family in my constituency and a neighbour of mine who wrote to me on the following day. And this is what he said. As I said earlier, this whole saga has been made quite personal to me and our family. I buried my father at Tober Key Presbyterian Church on Monday, the 15th of June. He'd been suffering from dementia for a number of years, and his final three weeks, we had to admit him to Causeway Hospital as he had taken an infection. We couldn't see him for over two weeks. And we finally got him home. Unfortunately, he passed away within two days. We were all well aware of the circumstances surrounding COVID-19 and the issues it was creating for families of the bereaved. We adhered to every single element of the legislation as described by the undertakers. Yes, we were disappointed. Dad couldn't be given the send-off that he richly deserved. It hurt. However, and I want the members opposite to listen to this, not only to hear, but to listen. Yes, it hurt. However, it hasn't hurt anything like the pain we have felt when watching what unfolded at yesterday's Republican funeral. It's an absolute outrage, and I'm livid as I write this to you, Mervyn, for there to be one rule for one and not the other is an absolute disgrace. So, Mr. Deputy, or Mr. Temporary Speaker, there are questions for the PSNI. And tomorrow morning, I alone with the First Minister, will meet the place in relation Could to Could the member questions. bring his marks to close, please? There are questions to the church authorities. There are questions to Belfast City Council. But I say to the Deputy First Minister in this House tonight, there are questions that you must ask, answer. And the best way you will answer them is by your actions. And I think those actions are to leave the office that you currently hold. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Mr. Pat Sheehan. I got to ask Ken Corla Shalladak, and I want first of all to declare an interest. They Bobby story carried them a college shogas come into into Brodjal, a shinna ra and show an act. Bobby story was a very good friend of mine, and I'm uh, very very proud to say that here tonight. And I'm conscious that there's a grieving family out there. In fact, two families: the story and the Pickering families. And I'm also conscious that many people who have lost loved ones during this pandemic are also grieving. Bobby uh, was the third friend of mine to have died since COVID-19 arrived on our shores. And on each occasion, the regulations were uh, completely different. Uh, so, you know, sometimes I think that people are trying to compare apples with pears, and that's not fair. And I wonder sometimes are some representatives uh, exploiting 
uh, the emotions of, of some people. I knew Bobby Story for almost 45 years. Uh, I was with him in the army. I was with him in prison. And I was with him in Sinn Féin. Uh, and Bobby Story did not go out to seek conflict. Conflict came to him as a young teenage boy when his family were driven from their home in North Belfast. And that's something that I shared with him and Bobby Sands also shared with him. Three of us who grew up in Unionist area with Unionist friends who were driven from our homes because of the sectarian nature of this state. And that's something that unionists should take cognizance of. And whatever, whatever, what, what... Point, Mr. Shin, point of order, Mr. Stolford. Point of order, you will be aware of the content of the motion. The content of the motion relates to breaches by government ministers. It doesn't actually relate to anything that Mr. Sheehan has said thus far in his comments. Could you instruct him to direct his comments to the content of the motion? I was actually listening very carefully to Mr. Sheehan to see who was going to come back to the, the motion, which of course was the funeral and the activity surrounding that. And uh, could I urge him to do so? And of course, this is about the funeral. This is entirely about the funeral, even though Daniel McCrossan and Mervyn Story have both said that it isn't about the, story, it isn't about the funeral. It's a, it is about Bobby's story. Uh, Bobby's story was a man uh, who didn't do anything half-heartedly. When he set his mind to something, he went and did it, and he gave it his full commitment, whether it was as an IRA volunteer, as a prisoner trying to escape, or as someone who was heavily involved in the peace process. And what debates like this do is it overshadows the contribution that Bobby's story made to peace in this country. I was with him in the H blocks in the early 90s when we discussed every twist and turn of the peace process. And when Bobby was released in, uh, in May 1994, he immediately joined the leadership and began selling the prospect of peace to volunteers within the IRA. Not as an enforcer, but as a convincer, uh, someone who debated and argued with volunteers uh, in the IRA and convinced them that there was an alternative to armed struggle. And he, the reason he was able to do that, because he was someone who led from the front, he was meticulous in his planning, and he was, and he was fearless. And that's why he got the support from IRA volunteers. And unfortunately, Republican funerals have been the subject of attack on many occasions. I remember Francis Hughes' body was hijacked by the RUC when uh, the family wanted to process along the Falls Road. I was at the Larry Marley funeral when it was attacked and mourners battened by the RUC and when plastic bullets were fired at mourners and, uh, in Finbar McKenna's funeral. And I was also there in Milltown when uh, uh, Michael Stone attacked the cortege. And I Mr. want to Mr. come Shane, to... Mr. Point Shane, where... out of order, Mr. Lands, you won't lose any time, Mr. Lands. I have already listened to Mr Sheehan in the Executive Office Committee glorifying terrorism. We have it again here today in this chamber. Surely it is wrong of us to take part in, 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 or to, to come out with comments like that that is clearly the glorification of terrorism. Mr Sheehan, I reminded you earlier the motion is about the events of last week um, and I have given you a fair degree of latitude to deal with the motion. And I think I've been very, very lenient, and I think you should now move on to the subject that's for, under debate. And I suppose, in, in the closing moments here, I just want to respond to Mr. Aiken, who talked in, 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 in dulcet tones about the concern he has for grieving families. Yet he was happy to re retweet a veil and despicable tweet the other night, which said about Bobby Story's death, it's one of his rare propaganda mistakes. <clears throat> has he been underwater so long that he has lost all his human decency? And he has forgotten, he has forgotten the age-old tradition not to speak ill of the dead. 
And I wonder, is Mr. Aiken going to retract that and make an apology to the Story family? Call Mr. Johnson Buckley. Thank you, temporary speaker. The rules are there for a reason. Everybody needs to follow them. Nobody is exempt. We are all being asked to do different things, difficult things right now, but we're being asked to do them to save lives. Deputy First Minister Michelle O'Neill, 9th of April. We have to send a message very clearly that by gathering in such big crowds, we're actually spreading the virus, and actually that's killing people. Deputy First Minister Michelle O'Neill, 4th of June. The public are rightly asking, Mr. Temporary Speaker, and I asked it today, what Deputy First Minister O'Neill do we have before us in this House today? What Sinn Féin do we have with us in the House today? Do we have the one that rubber stamped the coronavirus regulations? The one that stood up stairs preaching the messages previously outlined to the Northern Irish public? Is it the same one that called on businesses, named and shamed them, saying she will close them down if they do not follow or dare breach the regulations that she had put in place? Or is it the one that last Tuesday allowed the mask of respect integrity and equality to slip from her face as she blatantly breached the very regulations that she helped set. Throughout COVID-19, we have asked people to make life-altering sacrifices. And yet Sinn Féin believe that the standards which apply to ordinary people in this country should not apply to them. In a truly free and fair society, everybody must be equal under the law and equally subject to the law. And I feel this point goes to the very heart of the huge levels of anger which we're seeing at this time and witnessing throughout this country. Northern Ireland's success in combating COVID-19 has been centred on the foundation of public and household support for the laws and guidance introduced. Absolutely. I remember be aware of the Members' Code of Conduct. We all signed up to it when we became members here. It says in it, Members shall base their conduct on a consideration of the public interest, avoid conflict between personal interest and the public interest, and resolve any conflict between the two at once and in favour of the public interest. That's the rules that our people have been abiding by, but seemingly drawn from the Members' Code of Conduct. Deputy First Minister and her party don't think they apply to them. You have an extra minute, Mr Buckley. The record, as I have done before, that Sinn Féin ministers and members are in breach of both ministerial and members' code of conduct here, and you have quite rightly outlined that point. However, it is clear that Sinn Féin consider themselves above the shared effort and sacrifice made by the country throughout this difficult period. Grieving is universal. We are all human and we will all be capable of making mistakes. No one in this house, inside it or outside it, is infallible. But let me be very clear in what I'm going to say. This was no mistake. This was a premeditated, concerted effort from the Sinn Féin officials and hierarchy to bypass the law and place a hierarchy of grieving. Last week, I raised the conduct of five MLAs to the attention of an incoming commissioner, and I'm glad that will be appointed soon, who were in attendance. But I'm afraid I'm going to have to correct the record, because it has now been brought to my attention and become apparent that some 10 plus Sinn Féin MLAs were in attendance at the funeral of Bobby Story. The Deputy First Minister may not be able to bring herself to apologise, but she cannot escape the reality. And the reality is, that there is widespread sense of outrage towards her and her party colleagues. There are many questions following the Bobby Story funeral, which the Northern Ireland public rightly deserve answers to. What prior contact was made between Sinn Féin personnel and the PSNI in the facilitation of Mr Story's funeral? What made Bobby Story's funeral any different to Belfast City Council 
from every other funeral or cremation within its jurisdiction throughout the COVID-19 period. This is more than an error of judgment. You have acquiesced to a hierarchy of mourning and robbed families of the opportunity to say goodbye to loved ones. The entire episode has undoubtedly brought into question the credibility of the Deputy First Minister, and this has been summed up by her failure to take responsibility for her actions and apologise for the hurt caused. I believe that if the Deputy First Minister wants to restore any sense of credibility, she should consider her position and resign. It is the question that has been asked time and time again. If the author of the rules does not feel bound to uphold them, why should anyone else? Though, Mr Speaker, in closing, I want to assert that two wrongs do not make a right. I appeal to all those who may feel that an appropriate reaction to this blatant breach is to disregard the regulations yourself. Please do not. Keep the attention where it deserves to be. Would the member the lives of your loved ones could depend upon it. Thank you, Mr. Temporary Speaker. I call Mr. John O'Dowd. Mr. O'Dowd. Gourmet, uh, Temporary Speaker. Uh, and I, I too would like to add my sympathies to Theresa, the Pickering and Story families. And I welcome the belated uh, acceptance that there is grief in this story from some within the House today, though it has been a long time coming. Uh, when, when, when it's worth noting that when the MLAs who signed this motion drafted the motion, none of them thought themselves, well, will we speak to Sinn Féin to see if we can come forward with a motion which will give the public confidence that some in the chamber claim they're speaking on behalf on? Will we, will we try to bring forward a motion, or, or maybe later on, uh, uh, and will we speak to the party and try and bring forward a voice here which confirms the COVID-19 message as it is today? But none of that happened. The 37 MLAs who signed the motion decided to do so, for, and they're perfectly entitled to do so, except they're, they're right to do so. But there's not an attempt here to move forward. There's an attempt here, perhaps, to score political points by some. Uh, there's an attempt to, uh, re, to use the old battleground uh, between republicanism and unionism. And just for the record, Mr Story, it's as difficult for republicans to share power with your party as it is for you to share power with us. We accept that. We, no, I'm not giving away this one. We accept that. No, not this time. Uh, so we all have made sacrifices to advance the peace process. And I acknowledge all sides and that. But I have to say this, and I don't judge anybody on this. On this point, I don't judge anybody. When I look down the list of the 37 MLAs who have signed this motion, and when I look around the chamber at those who are present and those who are not present, I know that there's members who attended large funerals. I know there was members as neighbours, as friends, as constituency representatives, stepped out and offered sympathy at very, very difficult times for families they knew. I know that. I do not judge them. I do not pass any judgment on them for that. They are human. They did what they had to do at that time. I know there's members, one of whom called for the resignation of the Joint Force Minister today, who joined in a large crowd because he thought that was the right thing to do. And if I was in his constituents at that time, I probably would have done the same thing myself. But what I do judge is the blatant hypocrisy of those who have signed the motion, some of those who have spoken, and some of those... Point of order, Mr Buckley. Mr Temperley, Speaker, <laughs> I, th I feel it has been insinuated that Members that aren't present today in this chamber is because that they potentially are in breach of regulations themselves. Would you not make a ruling? Really, not every member, because of COVID regulations, can be in this chamber right now. So it is unfair, there, therefore, to, for them to be criticised. I, I do think that's a point of order, Mr. Buckley, but you, you've made your point. Mr. Chances of the time you used up, uh, Terry Speaker. Uh, I, I do stand and judge them on the blatant hypocrisy of their position. And I've not suggested people aren't here because. They, they may have breached the regulations. And it's worth pointing out, folks, the motion does not refer to the breach of regulations. The motion does not refer to the breach of regulations. Be aware of what you're voting for today. So 
The public will make up their own minds in these things. Uh, and the public will not be fooled by those who are presenting themselves as a defender of right or wrong. Because the public will have seen these also at these large gatherings, at these funerals, etc. And the public, I'm sure, appreciated the fact that you were there offering your sympathy and offering that human connection that we as elected representatives have to do uh, often. So I also want to just reflect on some of the, the messages today coming from the opposite branches around the first, the, the joint minister should resign. The motion you have signed does not call for resignation. There's a motion floating about the building which does call for resignation, but just haven't signed it. So stop sending out false messages to your base. There's no motion before this assembly today in relation to breach of regulations. There's no motion before this assembly today in relation to calling on the joint first minister to resign. I know those make good sound pops for the media or whatever it may be, but again, your, the public, your constituents will know exactly what you have tabled today. I want to return to respect. And I welcome the fact that there has been belated acknowledgement of Bobby's passing. But I do have to put on record my disbelief at the commentary of the leader of the SDLP in relation to comments from my colleague Martina Anderson at the Executive Committee talking about the death of our friend. The leader of the SDLP referred to him as sycophantic drivel. How on earth can anyone in a moment of grief refer to someone's comments about their friends and their friends as sycophantic drivel. I would ask for that to be withdrawn. And Mr. Aiken, could you look Teresa in the eye? Could you look Bobby's grandchildren could in the, the member, eye? Could the member bring his comments to a close, death, please? The way you did in the tweet. So I would ask Mr. Aiken to take the opportunity today and express his regret for retweeting the, that tweet, which has caused great um, offence. Thank you, Mr. Dowd. Um, as I said earlier, um, members have kept time, and I've indicated there is uh, slots for two members of the minor parties. Uh, so I'm going to ask Mr. Carroll uh, to speak at this stage. Mr. Carroll. Mr. Temporary Speaker, and I think we should remember that there is a family grieving uh, at this time, the, the, the Story family, and we should be uh, considerate uh, of that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Temporary Speaker, we learned yesterday that the Deputy First Minister Michelle O'Neill um, has not so much been contacted by the PSNI, um, yet on the other hand Black Lives Matter protesters have been fined, have been cautioned and have been aggressively pursued for prosecution for taking part in socially distant gatherings on the 6th of June and some have had a number of calls um, and as well uh, police interviews. This contrast sums up the hypocrisy of the state here. It's abuse of power and it's discriminatory implementation of the coronavirus regulations. Just weeks ago, when challenging Black Lives Matter protesters, Michelle O'Neill stated that, in, and I quote, gathering in such big crowds, we're actually spreading the virus and actually that's killing people. So we're asking people to protest in a different way. As it turned out, Mr. Speaker, the, these protests, which her party criticised, were safe, did not spread the virus and certainly did not harm anyone nor contribute to an increase in transmission. But the main point is this. Does the Deputy First Minister assume that uh, one rule exists for her and another for Black Lives Matter protesters? The hypocrisy is shocking. From the beginning of this crisis, um, people before profit have insisted that social distancing requires social organising and that any efforts to organise gatherings must be made with the utmost effort to ensure safety. We urge everyone to follow this approach, even in emotive and difficult circumstances, such as funerals. I think it is unfortunate that this was not the approach of Michelle O'Neill, as selfies released last week, we prove. Nonetheless, Mr Speaker, I avoid jumping on board the chorus of condemnation from the DUP and others who called on Michelle O'Neill to resign over attending the funeral last week. In fact, I was dismayed that those same parties who refused to call for cautions and fines for Black Lives Matter protesters to be dropped were the same parties who did not bat an eyelid when it came to powerful companies like Bombardier risking workers' health and breaking social distancing by forcing workers 
back to work before it was safe. The same parties who would not do what was necessary when workers were speaking out about unsafe conditions in Moy Park or when bosses in care homes were telling staff to work without PPE. The same parties who time and again in this chamber have argued for kick-starting the economy without even the semblance of a real test and trace system in their quest to restore the primacy of profits and the market, regardless of the cost to life. The same parties who implemented without question regulations which would give the state apparatus the ability to police ordinary people and workers, but not bosses or ministers. The same parties who hypocritically whitewashed the RHI racket. I want to be very clear, uh, Mr. Speaker, people before profit will not play any role in this farce, in this hypocrisy, and I believe that is what our voters expect of us. But I will say this clearly, at least, at least eight families were treated no thanks. We were treated differently to those who attended uh, a cremation at Roselawn last week. Clearly and understandably, this has compounded their grief. This should never have happened, and it was right for Belfast City Council to apologise. And I do believe an apology from the Deputy First Minister on that would go some way to easing the hurt that those families are feeling. But I also suggest that an apology is needed to Black Lives Matter protesters, not just from the Deputy First Minister, but from the whole executive as well. It's not surprising to me, Mr. Speaker, that uh, this hurt uh, comes off the back of a last-minute regulation change that was hastily and, in my view, undemocratically pushed through Stormont, which changed the amount of attendees at funerals at the 11th hour. It is exactly the method that was used to target Black Lives Matter protesters who are feeling a sense uh, of injustice. Last-minute changes, Mr. Speaker. We are told are coincidences, but seem to happen very regularly. There cannot be one rule, Mr. Speaker, for uh, politicians or those in power, and another rule for BAME protesters. The fines and threats against Black Lives Matter protesters must be dropped immediately. And it's time for uh, the Deputy First Minister and all ministers of the executive to support this call. It is greatly disappointing, Mr. Speaker, that I propose an amendment to refocus this motion toward this end, but it was not selected uh, for debate because the truth is the entire executive does own an apology to the BAME community for uh, its disgraceful treatment in recent weeks. Thank you. I should have explained that uh, the motion relates to an incident in Mr. Carroll's constituency, so that's why he got that particular slot for speaking. Mr Chambers. Uh, thank you, uh, Temporary Speaker. Um, the leader of Sinn Féin, Mary Lou Macdonald, was clear when she said that the funeral of Bobby's story was meticulously organised. It is that backdrop and those words we must use to couch all our remarks in respect to that funeral and the responsibility for what were clearly deliberate breaches of both the regulations and guidance issued by the executive. The attendance and behaviour of Sinn Féin ministers and MLAs sit with the Deputy First Minister. Her actions and her words have damaged the credibility of the executive. It has outlined a clear lack of integrity and has undermined her moral authority and that of the whole executive office. Now, this funeral and the story family grief that I acknowledge is only centre stage because some people who should have known better were not prepared to follow the same sacrifices of hundreds of families throughout Northern Ireland and how they buried their loved ones. On May the 10th, the Deputy First Minister said at a daily update, we also know that recovery will only happen one step at a time to do otherwise risks undermining the sacrifices people have already made and increases the risk of a second spike in the future. However, even before the funeral, there were significant breaches of the guidelines which state that wakes should not be held. There was a wake for Mr Storey, and Sinn Féin MLAs attended. I asked, did the Deputy First Minister attend? Sinn Féin MLAs were involved in large scale gatherings some days before the funeral when Mr Storey's remains were brought to his home to his family. On June the 11th, at a daily update, the Deputy First Minister said, however, with this freedom comes a serious responsibility for us all to follow the public health advice and guidelines to the letter. Before the funeral, there was a breach of the advice that funeral arrangements should not be advertised in order to curtail numbers attending. Sinn Féin's official Facebook page 
the MP Paul Maskey, the Assembly Speaker Mr Alec Maskey, and multiple other party figures were among those openly publishing the funeral timings and the route on social media. At the time, the executive was telling the public that only 10 people could attend a funeral, and the church authorities involved have confirmed that was the latest storm at the guidance that they had. That night, the advice on the executive website upped that number to 30, but that was after the funeral. The guidance also said that there should be no gatherings after the funeral, yet there are images of several such gatherings, some of them involving prominent Sinn Féin politicians. The guidance also states that coffin lifts should not take place unless the pallbearers all reside in the same house, yet Mr Storey's coffin was carried by several individuals, including Jerry Adams. On the 29th of June, the day before the funeral, the Deputy First Minister said social distancing guidance has been reduced to one metre. Two metres is still the optimum distance that everyone should try to adhere to in terms of social distancing. Published selfies that Mr Stalford referred to would suggest social distancing went out the window. And the fact that a sound system was in place in Milltown Cemetery would suggest that the organisers expected large numbers to turn up. But perhaps the most telling statement from the Deputy First Minister was made before the Black Lives Matter protest, and Mr Stalford quoted it, and I'll quote it again. She was reported as saying, but we have to send a message very clearly that by gathering in such large crowds, we're actually spreading the virus, and actually, that's killing people. How can the Deputy First Minister reconcile saying those words in light of what we all witnessed last week? It's a non-disputable example. Don't do as I do, but do as I tell you. And I have to put in record, I haven't heard anything in this House tonight that justifies the deliberate breaches of the regulations that are designed to save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chambers. Uh, Mr Butler has very kindly agreed to, to delete his name from the list to allow others in, and we're extremely grateful uh, for that. Mr Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Temporary Speaker. I am ashamed to be part of this Assembly today, having to debate what is the biggest scandal involving multiple members of this Assembly. We are not here today because it is an orange or green issue, and it's not. It's to do with breaking the law and the rules of this Assembly. But we are here today because we need to get to the bottom of why the Deputy First Minister, the Finance Minister, and at least five other MLAs, so that seems to be going up by the minute, that we knew of felt the need to abandon the public health measures that they insisted every other citizen must adopt to help save lives in our collective partnership to beat the COVID-19 pandemic. Let us look at the facts and the evidence. And I'm a bit mention some of the comments you've made. Even before the funeral, there's been a significant breach of the guidelines, which states that wakes should not be held. The guideline states there should be no remains taken home to rest. However, Sinn Féin MLAs Martina Anderson and Jerry Kelly were involved in large-scale gatherings days before the funeral. There was a breach of the advice that funeral arrangements should not be advertised in order to curtail numbers. Sinn Féin's official Belfast Facebook page quoted MP Paul Maskey, Assembly Speaker Alex Maskey MLA, and multiple other party figures were amongst those giving funeral timings and routes. Yes. The Member's Code of Conduct states members shall at all times conduct themselves in a manner which will tend to maintain and strengthen the public's trust and confidence in the integrity of the Assembly and never undertake any action which may bring the Assembly into disrepute. Does he believe this action brought the Assembly into disrepute? You have an extra minute, Mr Easton. Thank you. Um, I totally believe the Assembly has been brought into disrepute. Video footage and photographic evidence shows mass preaching of social distancing amongst crowds. At least 1,800 uniformed Republicans stood along the side in the expectation of a crowd and set up a public address system in the cemetery, something demonstrably unnecessary for 30 people meant to attend a funeral. Ms O'Neill specifically breached social distancing by standing to get a selfie. However, that was the fault of the blink of an eye. How many blinks of eyes did you have that day? The guidance says that there should be no gatherings after the funeral, yet there are images of several such gatherings, some of them involving prominent Sinn Féin politicians, such as Sean Lynch, MLA, having a selfie with 40 individuals at the Felons Club. The guidance states that it is also recommended that coffin lifts should not take place unless pallbearers all reside in the same house, 
yet the coffin was carried by several individuals. Even at the service, over 100 people attended the Mass when only 30 are allowed to attend. Yes. Appreciate the member giving way. Will the member recall a story that was ran in the Belfast Telegraph on March the 27th in which the Deputy First Minister told Ulster Carpets that they should close to protect employees during the coronavirus outbreak? Why should profitable businesses be forced to close but those rules don't apply when it comes to Republican funerals? Thank the, the member for his comments. Um, and, you know, we all have to abide by the law and we all must stick to the law and there can be no differences whether you're a member of Sinn Féin or anybody else. In my opinion, I believe that the rule of law has been broken and the PSNI must investigate. The health protection regulations NI 2020 have been broken and that the code of conduct for members has been broken. In addition, I believe the Deputy First Minister has also broken the ministerial code, in my opinion, on her pledge of office. This must be invested by, investigated by the incoming Assembly Commissioner for Standards. However, despite the clear evidence, the Deputy First Minister has not accepted that she or her party have broken any rules dis disregarding her own message, and I quote her, we are in difficult times, but none of us exempt from these regulations, just you, Deputy First Minister, and your party, Sinn Féin. During a Black Lives Matter protest, the protesters were given fines by the PSNI. Ms O'Neill admonished the protesters that they were spreading the virus and actually that's killing people. I put it to you, Deputy First Minister, that by attending the funeral, you and your colleagues were doing the exact same thing, spreading the virus and actually that's killing people by facilitating and encouraging crowds. Do you, Deputy First Minister, realise how you've made a mockery of this assembly? Why would anyone outside of this assembly even begin to take us seriously as the result of you and your party's actions? Deputy First Minister, do you realise or even care that 826 people have died so far because of the coronavirus pandemic? 826 families and friends have not been able to go to the funerals of their loved ones and friends as they sacrifice for the health and well-being of the people of Northern Ireland. We are all hurting. Yeah, go ahead. The member give way and also recognise it's not just those that have died from coronavirus, but it's perhaps 4,500 people. 4,500 to 5,000 deaths since the uh, beginning of April until the end of June. And all of those uh, funerals deserved the, the rights and respect of the ability to bury um, along with the regulations. Thank the member for his comments and totally agree that so many have suffered over the actions of the Deputy First Minister and her party. This week has shown that ordinary members of the public have been treated to a, a different standard than Sinn Féin. In addition, the anger that stretches far beyond those who disagree with Sinn Féin's politics. This funeral points to the remarkable hold in which old IRA veterans have on Sinn Féin, even forcing its current leadership who have no IRA backgrounds into actions which they must have known would only be politically indefensible, but a danger to public life. We then have the debacle of what happened at Roselong, which I don't have time to really go into, but it's clear that Belfast County Council, the PSNI, have questions to answer to what they knew in advance of the funeral taking place and why it was allowed to go ahead in the fashion that it did. Why were Could families the denied marks to close, the right please? to have their loved ones cremated and access denied? I want to make it clear that no family or person should be treated in any different way. In conclusion, Mr. Um, Speaker, could the member please uh, Sorry. conclude? Um, I would ask the Deputy First Minister to consider her position and resign until all investigations are concluded. Thank you. And I call Mr Jim Alistair. I'm hoping that we'll have time for Ms Sugden as well, Ms Sugden, but we'll see how this, things go. Mr Alistair. Thank you. By their actions, never mind their words, by their actions, Sinn Féin have been laughing in the faces of grieving families across this province, whether they were Protestant, or Catholic, Unionist or Nationalist. Sinn Féin, in the office they hold, decreed what these regulations would contain. They were very, very clear. Regulation 5.2G, which was in full operation in all its parts last Tuesday is abundantly clear. You could not attend the, friend, the funerals of your friends. And we had a Deputy First Minister who told us, of course, there were no exemptions to these regulations. And yet she, the 
proceeded to tell us she would never apologize for attending the funeral of a friend. Yet she made, she made the very regulations that said you couldn't attend the funeral of a friend. Yes. I will recall when the Deputy First Minister appeared in front of the Executive Office Committee, I asked her was it really so important for her to attend the funeral. One of the reasons that was given was because she was a political leader. Does he agree with me that that is a perfect example of politicians putting themselves above the people? You have one extra minute, Mr Alistair. Thank you. Yes, it's beyond doubt that Sinn Féin think they are above the law. They give some weasel word apology, some carefully crafted words in Conway House, which convey no apology whatsoever. And of course, we have experience of this. One of the members listed in this is Minister Murphy. We all know the cruelty with which he treated Paul Quinn's family by refusing to utter the words. And why is that? Well, it's the very same reason why every member of Sinn Féin has refused to back off this issue. It's because the Deputy First Minister and all the rest of them, their loyalty is not to these institutions, it's not to this uh, place. Their loyalty is a fidelity to the Republican movement. That is their first call, call of loyalty. And indeed, the Sinn Féin ideology is that there are a direct lineal succession of the provisional government of 1916 and the 1918 doll. And therefore, they say, in fact, the IRA is the lawful authority. Mr. Mr. Sheehan. I'm not sure where the, uh, this comes into the motion. I, I didn't hear any mention of the first doll. Mr. Alistair will be coming back to the motion very quickly. I think I've made it abundantly clear that we are here because of Sinn Féin's arrogance and refusal to face up to and apologise for putting themselves in a position where they declare to all that they are above the law. And I've just recited the reason why Sinn Féin, Mr Sheeran included, thinks he is above the law, because his loyalty is to a different law, that of the Republican movement. And of course, The very people who made that law are the very people we now find in breach. But they say, oh, we've apologised. No, they haven't. Weasel words. At best, what Ms O'Neill said was she was sorry that families across the country have been subjected to the difficulties of these regulations. She was even sorry if they were hurt by that. But she wasn't sorry for doing what she did and she underscored it by saying I do not apologize I will never apologize for attending the funeral of a friend it's like the apology that we got about the troubles we're sorry so many people died but the IRA's campaign was justified that's not an apology it's the same weasel words here I said they were laughing in the face of grieving families, they're also laughing in the face of this assembly, because they know this assembly hasn't got the will to do anything about it. In a moment. Because even look at this motion. This assembly is disappointed. I'm disappointed that it was raining this morning. There's no censure in disappointment. And of course, that just gives Sinn Féin more reason to laugh at this assembly, because they know that the absurdity of these arrange arrangements mean they can. Three quarters of the executive are disappointed in them, but they know they can cling to office. Why? Because of an absurd situation of mandatory coalition, which robs this House of the right of true sanction and proper control and proper respect to all those at whom Sinn Féin are laughing.
That's, bring his remarks to close, please. That's the reality of it. And I fear that this debate, sadly, and this is the challenge to this House, is this debate just about sound and fury signifying nothing? Could the Our member is going to do something about it? Brings, That's the challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just further to the point of order raised by Mr. Alistair at the start of business, I can confirm that the pri a private office. Uh, confirmed earlier this morning that Mrs O'Neill would have been responding in her capacity as Deputy First Minister. However, as Mrs O'Neill has clarified that she is responding in her position as an MLA, she has five minutes in which to respond. Mrs O'Neill. I'm a temporary speaker and I will confirm again that I am speaking in my capacity as, as an MLA. Um, firstly, let me say a lot has been said over the past week since the untimely death of Bobby Storey and also my attendance at his funeral. There has been an unfortunate, uh, considerable controversy over my decision to attend the funeral. As a member of this Legislative Assembly, I have taken every opportunity to set out my position. At the Scrutiny Committee last week, the Executive Committee, the Party Leaders Forum on Friday past, and this Chamber both yesterday and again earlier today. At the forefront of my mind are all the families who are grieving, all those that have lost loved ones throughout the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, of which there are many. I have listened carefully to the voices of those who have lost loved ones, and each and every one of those situations are tragedies in their own right. The untimely loss of a loved one is always very, very difficult, and there are no words to relate to the scale of the human tragedy of all those that have lost. And I also say that all grief is the same. I am particularly concerned that grieving families who have lost a loved one during the pandemic have had their heartache compounded by the necessary restrictions which were in place at points in time over the past few months. Not being able to have your family and friends to support them, to help them with through their mourning, and their grief has been hugely, hugely difficult. I realise that there are more families, that grieving families are experiencing more hurt over this past week. Indeed, many uh, MLAs this evening have spoke of different families, to, to Mervyn's neighbour, to John Dallet's family, to earlier talked about Bobby's family, all those families have been really, really hurt. And I'm sorry that that's the case. With hand on heart, with hand on heart, I can say that I would have always apologised for any unintended hurt that was caused. It was not, and it would never be, my intention to hurt anybody within society. I was invited to the funeral in my capacity as Deputy Leader of Sinn Féin to attend the Requiem Mass and to join the immediate family in the funeral cortege and to attend the ceremony at Milltown. The personal responsibility was upon me to, uh, was to ensure that my actions were in compliance with the regulations and the guidance, which I take very seriously. I am satisfied that I did act responsibly within the church as part of a limited group of no more than 30 people as part of the cortege and at the ceremony in Milltown where I paid my respects. Let me say very clearly, at no stage did I seek to give offence to anyone, including this chamber, nor would I ever seek to do so. I take, I'm going to make my statement. Thank you. I take very seriously indeed my responsibilities as a public office holder and as Deputy First Minister and Joint Head of Government. I can assure members that I have acted in accordance with those responsibilities. While the legislator is responsible for the regulations during this emergency period, it is the PSNI who are responsible for their enforcement. I understand that they will review the events of that day and will consider any suspected breaches of the health regulations. It is unfortunate that this matter has divided the Executive and the Assembly, that many of us have worked so hard to restore and to get on with delivering public services to the public that we serve. We have huge challenges before us and important work to do, and I firmly believe that all parties of the Executive are committed to this and to ensuring that we have stable power sharing after three years without functioning government. We have made good progress on all of this despite all of the difficulties. My commitment is to continue this work. Since the middle of March, the management of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been the Executive's number one priority, and our objective throughout has been to help keep people safe and to support those who have faced real hardship as a result of the pandemic. That has involved a huge effort from all involved. Our health, serve, health and social care workers, teachers, essential retail staff, those providing key local government services, industry and employee representatives, church leaders, and many, many more. People in every sector, public, private, community and voluntary, 
who had to abruptly stop their normal work and normal practices to join the fight against COVID-19 and help manage the risks and mitigate the impact of the pandemic. The progress that has been achieved is entirely due to the support and concerted effort of everyone. And as a result, we have now reached a key turning point in the management of the crisis, where the executive's attention is able to move from purely controlling the public health response towards planning for economic health and societal recovery instead. We have come a long way in a very short time, and the fact that we are now able to carefully reverse our way out of the restrictions represents huge progress. COVID-19 is still with us, and I will continue to lead us through this and into the recovery, where we are looking beyond the response phase towards the actions that will be needed to affect robust and sustainable recovery, rebuild public services, and restore more ways of living. There are many challenges facing us, and in moving forward, we also need to pick up on the urgent, pri urgent priorities and plans in other important areas unconnected with COVID-19, including in relation to those key issues contained within the new decade, new approach, the basis on which these institutions of the Good Friday Agreement were restored back in January. Thank you, Temporary Speaker. Hey, I have no, inten no intention of resigning, Mr Alistair, I can assure you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, can I now call upon Mr Colm McGrath to conclude and wind up the debate. Mr McGrath, you've got 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr Temporary um, Speaker. And none of us would want to see you resigning from your role. Uh, I thank members for their contribution to this motion today. This issue is incredibly sensitive, and I recognise the passion with which members have spoken about their experiences of loss and the experiences of their constituents. We have asked people to make immense sacrifices over the course of the last few months, particularly during periods of trauma and grief, and that has been reflected in the testimony that we have heard today. This motion is not, as some may have characterised it, about political point scoring. It is about the character or actions of the man whose funeral members of our executive attended last week, and we should acknowledge the pain of that grieving family. This is about the serious breach of trust that has taken place between ministers and members of the public who were told that their ability to mourn had to be constrained to protect others. It is about the failure to acknowledge that by breaching the public health guidelines that this executive issued, its ministers have critically undermined their own authority. And it's about the basic failure to acknowledge that they did, what they did was wrong and it was wrong, and they should apologise. Give way to the member. Hey, would the member agree with me that a commissioner for standards is due to be appointed soon? Then surely the first and deputy first minister will have to move swiftly to appoint the other members of the panel for ministerial standards, as without this, there is no prospect of accountability in this assembly, and we will continue to move from one political crisis to another. I thank the member for her contribution. And yes, I think it's important that we have all the apparatus of the executive and the assembly and these institutions in place so they can fulfill all of the responsibilities that they have. But we have not come here to this chamber today seeking to tear down these institutions. We have not sought to exclude ministers from office. What we're asking for is an acknowledgement of the pain that their actions have caused and an apology for carrying out those actions. Because to date, the denials and the doubling down has sapped more and more authority from the Deputy First Minister. This is about restoring the credibility of our public health advice and allowing us to keep the public with us as we seek to keep them safe. I give way to the member. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you for giving way. Can I ask those who have put their name to this motion, if the Deputy First Minister doesn't apologise, as has asked, what are the next steps? What do those parties intend to do? Well, we'll give that consideration after we have concluded the debate this evening. It is simply no longer credible for the Deputy First Minister to come in here and deny that she has breached the public health guidance. That is beyond doubt. And it is no longer acceptable for a half apology that expresses regret if people were hurt. There is no if. People in every community, from every background, were hurt seeing hundreds of people led by our joint First Minister at that funeral when so many were led to rest without their close family present. And since it has not come 
from the Deputy First Minister so far, let me apologise to those who have been hurt on behalf of this Assembly and on behalf of politics here. You have been badly let down by the people who asked you to make unimaginable difficult sacrifices, by people who have since shown themselves incapable of sharing that sacrifice. I am sorry with that. When the moment came to show solidarity, the message that, we, that was sent out from our joint head of government is that her movement, her people and her pain is more important than yours. And it's more important than the public health advice we've issued to keep everyone safe. Coronavirus has ripped the heart out of many families. There have been many direct deaths as a result of the virus, over 550 in the north, and many other untimely deaths or excess deaths which have not been classed due to, the, due to coronavirus, but are probably due to it in some way. In total, with the other natural deaths, there's been over 5,000 people that have lost their lives in the north since the pandemic began and the introduction of restrictions in March. Mr. De uh, Mr. Temporary Speaker, that is 5,000 families suffering the pain and emotion of a family death, often older people and the lead generation of a family, but not always so. And they were told in no uncertain terms that they must stick to the rules. They must abide by the regulations, no deviating from them, all in the interest of public safety. They did the right thing. They stuck by the rules, and they did it for one reason and one reason only, for the greater good of our community, to stop the spread of the virus, to save lives. And it wasn't just about the funeral, Mr Deputy Speaker. It was about the whole grieving process for those families, because they did what they were told. They had no wakes. They had no visitors to the houses. And they asked people that if they must line the route, they should do it with social distancing. They stuck to the rules for chapels, with significantly smaller numbers than in this case. They took their time slots and followed staff guidelines at the crematorium, and they didn't organise after services. Nor, Mr Deputy Speaker, did they organise and invite people to the funeral, organise dress codes, and set up PA systems so the obviously expected crowds could hear. Regulation after regulation was broken. Advice after advice was flouted. Rule after rule was ignored. And then the party wonder what all the worry and the concern is about. Yes. Is it not also the case that we need to put on record this wasn't the first Republican funeral? And could the members speak in? Could so the members speak in? Yeah. Mr. Timbers. This wasn't the first Republican funeral. There have been four other occasions when there were clear breaches in relation to the regulations. I'm here today to talk about this issue, and I don't want to stray from that. The decision by Sinn Féin and the wider Republican movement has sent a message to the community of the North that they are different, that they are special, that they are the elite. And Sinn Féin too have lauded themselves as being the anti-establishment party, yet they forget one thing. They are the establishment. They are the elite. They are on high as the joint leaders of government and have been for 13 years. They have made it to the lofty heights of where they are and chose to look down on others and say, do as we say, not as we do. More reminiscent of 1990s Tories than freedom fighter or socialist that I know. But Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to talk for a moment just on a few of the comments that were made. Mr Stalford, in starting, said that people had stuck to the letter and the spirit of the guidelines. And I have outlined how I feel that they have. And it was the difference and the straying from that that is causing much of the pain. He also highlighted correctly how many, many people felt that the executive was working well, that it was pulling in the one direction, that it was reaching out and helping the community. And I hope we can get back to that stage if there's an appropriate apology. Orla Flynn also mentioned and detailed how important Mr Story was to members of Sinn Féin. And I acknowledge that. And you also mentioned how uh, whenever people pass, that is an important loss to them, and I acknowledge that as well. But I go back to the remark about the 5,000 people that have lost loved ones in the North over the last period of time. But there was a difference, and it's the difference here in what happened afterwards that we're referring to, not the loss of the person, which, of course, we would want to send our condolences to the family. 
Daniel McCrossan highlighted how uh, we managed to contain the spread of the disease by sticking to the rule. And that was a difficulty because we feel that by people breaking the rules, they were then going to see an increase in the spread of the, uh, of the, of, of the coronavirus if we broke the rules. And he also mentioned John Dallet and Eben Putt's father. And we appreciate that they and those families had to go through difficult times as well. I'll give way. Uh, thanks very much for giving way. I'm just wondering when <coughs> you talk about we, do you include uh, Mr. Aiken in that after the retweeting of the veil and disgusting tweet that was very hurtful for the Story and Pickering families? Is he included in that we who are sending out our condolences? Kermayavid. Thank the member for his intervention, and I'll never support any uh, retweet that has been done in a hurtful or harmful way, but I'll leave it for those individuals to account for their behaviour. Uh, just for a matter of clarity for the House, of course, I was retweeting something by a Mr Austin Stack, and I think we all in this House know Mr Stack's relationship with the Republican movement. Th okay, thank you for the member's intervention. I actually was going to move on to his intervention and suggest that he had used the word regret, uh, and as it was in a different context. Uh, but you did mention that this isn't an issue that is orange and green, uh, that this is indeed about right and wrong. If I could ask Mr. Temporary Speaker if I get the extra minute that others may have. No, order, order. The, the, when you submit, you don't get an extra minute. It's only, <laughs> I was chancing. Uh, I have been around the building too long to, to, to fall for that one. Uh, he has. <laughs> He has been very generous, I accept, with the interventions, but unfortunately he's paid the penalty for that, that he has lost out the opportunity to conclude his speech, but I'll no doubt read it in next week's Down Recorder anyhow. Uh, could, could I, first of all, apologise to Claire Sugden and, and to Ms Woods. I, I, I did try. I did try to make certain that all those who wished to speak got a chance to do so, but unfortunately some members were very liberal with interventions and we just run out of time. And I know personally how frustrating that could be, can be. Can I also thank all the members for the tenor and the moderation that was shown this afternoon. This could have been a bloodletting session. This could have stoked up difficult uh, emotions leading up to the period that's ahead of us. But everyone, in my opinion, put their views forcibly, but in a way that I thought was very responsible. And I'm extremely grateful to you all for the way in which that occurred. I suspect, as I move to the next point, that's where the, the agreement will, will end. But I'm going to put the, this motion standing in the order port paper all, to be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, country, no. Uh, so I'll tell that again. All those in favour say aye. aye. Country, no. no. I, I, think, aye. I, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. There's no condensation, no, no condensation. <laughs> nobody is arguing with that, to the contrary. Uh, so I said, the eyes have it, the eyes have it. The next, Mr Lyons. Thank you very much, Mr Temporary Speaker. Before any of us came into this House, indeed, before any of us could take our seats, we had to sign the undertaking. The undertaking says that we are required to support the rule of law in word and in deed, uh, and to support all efforts to uphold it. I do not believe that the glorification of terrorism is in keeping with that undertaking. I do not believe that the trying to justify membership of a prescribed organisation, as Mr Sheehan had done earlier on, uh, is in keeping with that undertaking. I think that it would be appropriate if there is a ruling made on that so that we do not find ourselves in the position in the future where members of this House can get up and justify membership uh, of a terrorist organisation. Thank you. I have no doubt the Honourable Member feels strongly about that point, but it isn't technically a point of order as in the, uh, the organisation of this debate. But no doubt his uh, information, is now, his views are now on record and perhaps could be referred to another body. Point, point Mr Lyons. Uh, I would like the Speaker to, to rule on this. I do believe it is a very serious issue. I am not just wanting uh, to put it on the record, uh, I am wanting a ruling. I believe this is very, very serious. I will indeed refer this to the Speaker, who no doubt is watching this online uh, as we speak, uh, and will no doubt consider that issue. Uh, we now move to Mr. Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
In the Speaker's office making a ruling, can we also put it on record that it is also forwarded on to the incoming uh, c Commissioner for Standards of this House? It's not the role for the Speaker to refer anything to the Commissioner for Standards, but it is indeed up to any individual member, if they wish to do so, or indeed any private individual, to refer a matter to the incoming Commissioner. Uh, and no doubt uh, members are aware of what's been said and can take the necessary decisions they feel appropriate. Item six, if there's no other points of order, item six, six in the order paper is the adjournment. Can I just remind members that there is an ad hoc committee uh, on Thursday uh, in, in this chamber? Uh, I believe it's the Minister for...